is Ayan Saeed and I arrived last night to some form of welcome. So it was amazing, the energy was buzzing and I'm just really shocked that beginning of September I had no idea you all existed. I had no idea the community met up and did these amazing activities that I've been exposed to. But I just want to know how's your night. So two hands, how if you're feeling, um, if you felt the fire, you felt the energy, I saw the dancing that was happening. Oh, yeah. All right, fantastic. And then we also now, you started um, this morning with a lot of intellectual conversations, a lot of intellectual um, discussions. And I'm going to pass it over to Charlotte to see how that was for you. Amazing. All right, give me one hand up if you went to a half decent workshop this morning. Give me two hands if you went to a brilliant workshop this morning. Amazing. So Ian and I have been running around trying to get a flavour of all the different workshops this morning. And we thought I'd, we'd do our little summary. So um, Ian's going to kick it off with two things that stood out for her at the workshop she attended. And I'll do the same. And as we do, I'd love you to hold on to the two things that really stood out to you from this morning and maybe take a note of them. So Ian, what were your two things this morning? So many great things. I don't even know how I broke it down into two things. But my first Good Fest um, workshop was by Gillian Barons, and she reintroduced. Woo! <laughs> Great time, yeah. <laughs> and I learned about um, about manifesting and dedicating and giving into our wild ideas, manifesting that in a way that is holistic, that activates us to live in joy. And that one of the, one thing I really heard from Stacey as well, who I met last night, was I just want a simple life. I just want an easy life. There's no complications where I can enjoy myself and exist and in my full self, and I think that's one thing I gained from the workshop and everyone that was around us in that community. And then the second thing is, um, we were reminded of Atomic Habits. Who's read Atomic Habits? Yeah, that book, if you have it by James Clear, it has to be on your bookshelf because it really teaches you about creating systems, and Janine really in brought that back into play and said, it's not about our goals and reaching them, it's about the systems that we create to achieve those goals more. So there's a lot of emphasis on that. So. Amazing, amazing. There's just been so much. That's a tiny flavor of one of the nine workshops that happened. Um, my two things that I heard were brilliant gems of wisdom from Amy Wright. You cannot stand for everything. When you're trying to make your message mesmerizing, enter the conversation that's already happening in the head of the person you're trying to speak to. Enter the conversation that is already happening in their head. Trust is one of your biggest assets. Don't blow it keep your promises. So in all your comms, trust is your biggest asset. Keep your promises. Fucking love that. All right. So now we are preparing ourselves for the final two sessions of Good Fest 2022. <laughs> and I am going to help us get into that space. And then you're going to hear two fantastic things. I am. And I think with this second segment, we've got our youth representatives sharing their stories. And I think that a lot of people that have been having conversations with, have been discussing about intergenerational conversations, lived experiences. So really for us to sit down with what that means and hear these voices that are sharing their stories with us and having that humane, and in my workshop we discuss about creating human spaces where we hear out the voices of all groups um, in our community. So that's one thing. And then we've got our keynote speaker, Mark Taylor, speaking and sharing some things as well. So. Take a moment to breathe. And then we're going to do some amazing um, youth. Go for it, Nadia. Go for it. Thank you so much for inviting me up to the stage. And what a great experience it has been so far. These classes to date are going to be so inspiring, and I hope you have been as well. Um, so, as introduced, myself and Beryl are here to give a youth perspective of which is very often excluded from lots of conversations. Now, we're here to give our voice and our opinions. We're not here to represent all of you. We can't do that. We've got to speak to different people and we can't represent everybody. So we're here to give our values and our thoughts and our opinions and we hope that you're interested in us. So I want to start by asking you a couple of questions. And if they're true for you, you can please stand up. The first question is, have you ever felt unable express your emotions in a business or climate context. If that's true, you can stand up. <laughs> no. And the second question is, please remain standing up if you feel as though empathy and care are vital to the foundations of the solutions, both to climate and the ecological crisis. So is it 
that weird? Isn't that strange that the two main values that I believe anyway and I do have shown that you believe two are foundations for our solution? Would he start to show would he start to show our emotions and our vulnerabilities? So I invite you to be vulnerable, I invite you to open up. Um, express your feelings however you like. It could be through tears, it could be through a shaky voice, or which I probably have at the moment. It's probably a bit of your subject, um, but I invite you to be vulnerable. And the reason I start with this is because my journey to the time activism has come from a vulnerable and quite a low, low space. So just being open and being vulnerable, and I hope that this is accepted, and especially for creating a space for me to be able to share this with you. So last year, I got into a very low space, probably one of the lowest that I could ever imagine being in. And it was for a multitude of different reasons. However, it was a space that I couldn't get out of. I didn't know how to get out of it. But the reason why I stayed here, that was the level of the situation. I didn't want to really be here, but the reason why I stayed here was because of the people around me. And that was my survival. However, how I thrived since then has been finding my home in my climate activism. Finding home in communities, finding home in organisations that really inspire hope, that really show us that we've got a place, that we can be here and we can make a difference. So one of the reasons why I did want to be here actually turned out to be one of the reasons why I really want to be here and why I really want to thrive and I really want to connect communities just like these and it's people just like you which are the reasons I know I'm still here and I know so many others are still here as well. And this is big, this is heavy stuff, but I'm afraid it is the reality. With lots of my friends who are the same age who are heavily entrenched in climate activism, this is the same. A lot of them haven't wanted to be here before and that may have been because of the climate crisis and the reason why they're holding on is because of people like you. People who are here, people who are portraying hope and giving a meaning to what's being here. So, to kind of lighten up <laughs> a little bit of this a little bit, because I'm aware that I'm very, very deep. Um, Um, there was a point in 2020 when I ended up quitting 
I, I ended up quitting my grad job because I thought that there wasn't enough change happening. And so I did activism full time without any pay. Um, I sacrificed you know, my career for the future of the planet, out of, just out of love for you know, everyone's future here. Um, and since then, I've sort of worked for several companies. I've always sort of like tried to find companies that are doing more for the planet. Um, uh, but at the same time, I've used activism as a tool for me to deal with the trauma that I face on a, on a daily basis. Um, and activism is sort of like a gateway to, to voice my opinion, and it's, it's, it's an amazing tool to create change. So hopefully we're going to go through a few things today um, on how to, um, yeah, how, how, what can businesses do, and what can businesses do to get more involved in activism. In terms of how I feel right now about the climate crisis, um, I'm really frustrated, very frustrated. It's like a roller coaster. It's always up and down. Sometimes I feel really, really hopeless. Uh, sometimes I feel like, you know, do we even deserve this planet um, from the news we hear sometimes? But I think the only thing that, that's keeping me going is, is hope. And I think we've got to have hope. Um, and, and activism is another thing, and community as well. The same people, like-minded people who are doing something about, about the climate crisis, who have love and empathy, that's, that's what's keeping me going. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so yeah, I am. I use LinkedIn as a really as a tool to influence change within the business community, within decision makers, uh, because I think that could be that is one of the ways we could sort of be bringing about change and bringing about social change faster. Um, and yeah, the way I use LinkedIn is I use it to voice my opinion without sort of being fluffy. I just say things as they are. Um, without trying to impress anyone, without trying to sort of be liked. And it does upset a lot of people. <laughs> and it does upset the fossil fuel industry professionals a lot, that a lot of them contact me on, on LinkedIn and on my comments. And I've seen comments in your posts as well from climate deniers, um, which is really interesting. Um, and it does, it, it does pain me to see so many, so many people out there that are still, that still do not accept the climate science, even though there's so much evidence around it. Right now, this, like everyone over here is conscious about the climate and it is a bit of an echo chamber. And we are the minority um, as well. But when you, when you go outside, actually most of the population still do not think that the climate crisis is, is, is an issue that is pressing and we need to deal with it as, as, as soon as possible. Um, what, I found, what I find the hardest and which sort of does lead to a lot of breakouts, uh, sorry, um, um, what's the word? Burnout, sorry, <laughs> um, is when I get a lot of resistance from people who are on our side, uh, when people who you think that are supposed to be, you know, supporting, supporting us, supporting me, and this is where you know a lot of the cancel culture comes in. Um, so yeah, I get, I get, I also get a lot of resistance from people from the sustainability community um, regarding several issues, like you know, when it comes to sort of. People thinking that oh I'm alienating I'm alienating everyone else from doing other things, but actually I think everyone else is on a journey as well, and we do need to take smaller steps. Um, so that really really um, yeah that that causes a lot of a lot of burnout. Um, I guess one of the ways to deal with that is uh, just talk just talk to people about it. Um, I I. 
I think dealing with climate denies is, is, is not too bad because you know that the space they're in is, and, and, the, and the space that they come from is because of this, their environment. But when, when, when you get a lot of resistance from people who are really conscious about climate change, it's a different thing. Because you think that they're supposed to be on, their, on our side. Um, so I just, yeah, I sort of tend to carry on. I'm also going to uh, insert a shameless plug over here. Please do connect with me on LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh, and, and do support our force as well, connect, connect, with, connect with Amelia as well. Um, I've been also trying to push more younger people, more youth voices to come onto LinkedIn and to be part of the conversation, to, yeah, to, be, that, to be that change um, on LinkedIn. Um, there's a lot of cancel culture within activism as well. There's a lot of resistance from other groups, um, environmental groups, uh, who think that other environmental groups are not doing the right thing. Um, and that's something that hurts me a lot because we're not gonna we're not gonna win and we're not gonna create change if we are against each other. We need to unite. We need to we need to spot our differences, but and keep but keep our differences aside. Uh, and there was a really good quote in um, in the workshop that Ayan had um, earlier that we need to keep our uh, differences aside and just work together. And it's working together. It's that unity that's actually going to create that difference because it's all in it's all in numbers. If we, the, the more people we get on our side, the more the faster we will create change. Um, I also wanted to mention a bit about um, so COP twenty six that happened last year in November. Even even with COP twenty six, uh, the Climate Action Track has said that with the pledges of COP twenty six. Uh, we're on track for a 2.4 degree increase in global emissions. Without COP26, clearly because of the energy crisis, uh, we're definitely not on track for 2.4. We're on track for three, between three and four degree increase in global temperatures. Um, there's there's a really good graph in the IPCC report which said that actually, so the the two degree increase in global temperatures is an average uh, increase. When you look at the increase on, on, on water, it's actually, you know, it's fairly, fairly moderate. But when you look at the increase on land, that increase, if it's two degrees, it can be anywhere between seven degrees and 10 degrees. So imagine July, July in July 2022, we, we just experienced 40 degrees uh, in, in London, and we're only at 1.2 increase in, in global temperatures. Imagine what it's gonna be like um, at two degrees we are going to face 50 degrees Celsius in the UK by between 2050 and 2100, and it's coming. And that really, just, just, just have a think about that. That's, that's what's coming for us. And, and as someone who is, who is younger, um, ha, I, I just, I, that's, that's where my hopelessness comes from. Um, how are we actually going to survive 50 degrees over here? If it crosses 55 degrees, 55, if it crosses 55 degrees, humans will not be able to survive. Uh, because 55 degrees with a certain uh, rainfall temperature uh, and humidity, uh, our bodies will stop regulating our temperature. And we're not far off from that. Um, just, just looking at Pakistan as well, um, um, you know, they, they face 50 degrees actually this, this, this summer. Um, and if, if we are facing 40 degrees now, imagine what it's going to be like in, 20, in 30 years time in, for them in Pakistan. And again, also they're facing the flooding at the minute, uh, you, as you've seen in the news. Um, an area the size of the UK is underwater in Pakistan. That's how big it is, and it's not even reported massively in, in the media. It, uh, right now, it's like a hurricane, but that's quite bad as well. In, in, in the US, that's, that's what they're facing. But yeah, that's the reality of it, and I, I really want everyone to sort of like feel, feel just, just envision what future is coming for us. And it's not just the younger people as well. It is everyone else in this room who is gonna, who is gonna face this, these issues as well. So very heavy, very stark reality, but it's important that we have that to real mirror it. But the reality is I remember we had that conversation, you mentioned the average temperature, and I was getting quite intrigued with it, but that really shocked me, and that really took me back. So it's going to affect everybody here. It's going to affect everybody that works for your businesses, that you're connected to, your stakeholders, your partners, your friends, your families. So we want to kind of take a little step back and ask you to do a little bit of reflection. So you would have seen a post-it note on your chair. We invite you to take that out. It might be under your bottom. <laughs> and we 
invite you to just take two minutes, one to two minutes to have a think and to write down one way in which you can embed mental health in your business, either for your business or individually, for your employees, for yourself. Um, because it's a lot that everybody has to deal with and we need to make sure that this is ingrained in our, in our structures. We'll also be asking for a couple of people to do that, so just have a think about it.
Um, so yeah, I've got quite a lot to say uh, about this. Um, so there's some water leaking from there, so I, I'm not reading myself, just from the say. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. It's a flat roof, and it's not going to stop the speakers. Don't worry. It's sorted. We're on it. We're on it. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, so a bit of context. Um, I got really interested in business activism earlier in in. Yeah, in, in about April. Um, for, so, uh, something I forgot to say earlier. So I, work, I currently work as a sustainability consultant at a, a company called Element 4, uh, which is also a B Corp. Um, so I do that job three days a week. And then I also work for Just a Foil, which is a, a sort of a environmental campaigning group. I also do stuff for the Extinction Rebellion, Animal Rebellion, uh, and a few other, a few other um, environmental campaigns as well. So I do that sort of either part-time or full-time, just because that's one of the ways I deal with my, my eco-anxiety. So yeah, business activism is a really interesting thing because I feel like there's a lot of stigma around activism, um, but there's a lot that businesses can do uh, to get involved in activism. And I think, um, so we're just gonna sort of like cover some of the, some of the areas. Uh, someone said yesterday that businesses uh, there was a comment yesterday that businesses should not be political. I um, just want to start by saying that climate change is political. Um, and businesses should absolutely get involved in, 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 in the political side of things. We need, uh, you've probably heard of CSR, which is Corporate Social Responsibility. Um, and this is something I came across in, in April. There is also something called Corporate Political Advocacy as well. Um, we know about the fossil fuel industry and how they lobby the government. They donate to the government. Um, they pretty much, they've got so much power in the government. And if environmental, environmentally conscious companies also started to lobby the government, that would provide the fossil fuel industry with more resistance. Um, so that's one of the ways I feel like businesses can get more into activism. Uh, and so providing that resistance with the fossil fuel industry Telling the truth about the climate crisis, informing and challenging our own employees, uh, and also challenging our clients. If you think that your values are not in line or not uh, aligned with uh, your clients, I've spoken to a lot of people over here actually that I met over over the over the days, and they've told me that um, that you know you reject you reject clients uh, who you think that are not are not doing enough for the for the planet, and that's amazing. That sends out a really, really powerful response to them because then they will start thinking, "Oh crap! Why did we, you know, why did we just get rejected? Maybe that's something within us that we need to change." So I think that's quite powerful. Um, encouraging employees to get involved in activism. Um, the company that I work for, Element Four, uh, they're going to be joining the Extinction Rebellion protest on the 14th of uh, 14th of October this uh, this month, and. I just think that's that's brilliant uh, because we do need all forms of activism within within the environmental space that we're in in order to uh, accelerate social change. And I know Ecosia and Patagonia also uh, encourage their employees to get involved with protests. I was actually in a protest uh, at a protest in in, in Bristol uh, last year, and I sort of came across a few people from Patagonia who said that they shut down their store to be at, uh, at a climate change protest. And I was, I was shocked because I was like, wow, that's amazing. You, like, they actually put uh, the planet before their profits and that's sort of displaying it by example. And that, like, you know, that made me actually love the company even more. That said a lot about their brand. So I feel like we should, more companies should do that. We should actually support um, more people within, our, within, 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 uh, within companies to take more action because there's a lot of, a lot of people are scared a lot of people are scared of what the company will will think about them. What will what, what the company will um, will do if, like you know, they, I think arrest is another thing. But not everyone needs to get arrested. But yeah, I think Ecosia and Patagonia, for example, and the company that I work for would support me if I did get arrested uh, for the for a cause that I believed in. Um, the other thing I was going to say is I think we need to stop doing things to be liked. Change, getting people to change is very hard. It's, humans do not like change. 
That's something you know throughout throughout history, and it's just ingrained in us. We hate change, and that's something really difficult to address. And if we do things that if we do things to be liked, we're not sort of yeah we're not we're not going to get there as fast as we need to get there. So one of the ways to break out of your echo chamber is to do things that challenges other people, uh, get outside of your echo chamber, um, say things as they are, rather than sort of rather than putting rather than making things fluffy, I'd say. Um, and yeah, don't yeah I don't like it, don't don't feel bad to let go of clients who you think are not making an impact. There's different there's different forms of activism. You can you, you know you can get involved in political advocacy. You can get involved with civil disobedience if you want to. Um, you can get involved in groups that are advocating advocating for policy policy change. Get involved with get involved with other groups who are actually pushing for for policy change because that's when that's when change comes and also like work definitely work with the governments as well to uh, to get them on the right path. And I know it's very difficult with the current government. Um, uh, for example, <laughs> so one of the things that Just Stop Oil were doing, so Just Stop Oil, yeah, as I mentioned before, is a campaigning group. And we're trying to get the government to stop issuing new oil and gas licenses. Um, as of February this year, uh, February, March this year, the government said that they were going to issue out new 40 new oil and gas licenses, uh, which is a bit shocking because at COP26, they said they were going to wind down fossil fuels and they were going to they, they were going to phase down coal as well. That's not happened. Uh, instead, the current government has said that they're going to issue 130 new oil and gas licenses. Those those licenses and those projects that are going to come online, they're only going to come online in 10 years' time. And once they do come online, that will that carbon will be locked in for another 20 years. That's so it'll be in use until 2050, and 20, 2050 is supposed to be when we're supposed to be reaching net zero. So how? It's it's not going to work. It's not going to work. How are we going to how are we going to address these the, these issues? How are we going to get there fast enough? I think you know, I, and I, I think we're going to ask you some of the questions later on. Like it would be good to hear from you as well on how we can address these issues, because we do need to speak more about it. Um, in the talk um, from the guy from Patagonia yesterday, um, yeah, he mentioned one percent for the planet, which is really good. I think definitely get involved with that. I think donating, uh, if you if you can't get involved with other forms of activism, if you can't get involved with protests or civil disobedience, uh, try supporting uh, environmental movements, grassroots environmental movements by donating your time to help them organize, uh, help. Uh, you can you can donate money to them as well, like one percent of your profit. That would be amazing. And also, um, I think there was this research that was done uh, a few months ago that showed that when you donate your money to uh, protest movements, it, it causes a, it, the, the results of environmental or social change is a lot more, more effective than donating to any other, any other charities. Uh, and the reason for that is because even though uh, when environmental protests take the streets, it's very negative in, 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 in the media, but it doesn't matter because, for example, the Daily Mail are always going to be negative. They, they call the UK Met office uh, alarmists uh, when, uh, when, the, <laughs> when, when, the, uh, when the heat waves were happening in, in July. So if the, if the UK Met office are alarmists, they're also calling us alarmists. So anyone who is basically saying or challenging the status quo are alarmists. So, so don't be afraid to, to, to donate to environmental societies who come across as negative, but they are still creating change. And we can't imagine what things would have been, been like without Extinction Rebellion. Maybe we might have not even declared a climate emergency. Or maybe we wouldn't have even had a 2050 in, in, in law. Um, so definitely, you know, even even if you don't agree with and with some of the environmental movement's tactics, definitely, you know, we're still all in the same boat, and every every sort of tactic is needed right now because we're desperate. We're in desperate times. We only have two to three years left to change the course that we're on before we see runaway climate change. You've got two to three years to make the decisions, to make the right decisions, and then from twenty from twenty thirty onwards, we need to see that change happen. We need to see a rapid de uh, decarbonisation. And I know everyone in this room has the power to do stuff. Uh, and, and, and we've got this community together. And I think what would be amazing is for 
from all the stuff that you've heard over here, go and speak to other people about it. Even just having, just bringing climate change into the conversation would make a huge difference. In fact, that's a form of activism as well. Just mentioning or just talking about climate change in, with, with, with your other colleagues or with anyone who you come across with. And the, the other thing I wanted to briefly speak about as well um, is the other elephant in the room, which is we talk about we talk a lot about fossil fuels, but we don't talk about we don't talk enough <coughs> about animal agriculture. That is the second biggest contributor to 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 deforestation to um, to, uh, to to global uh, greenhouse emissions as well, and we need to start using. We need to start talking more about animal agriculture. And there's a lot of business. There's a lot that businesses can do to address issues, like for example, in, introducing meat free Mondays within our companies, and also maybe you know signing a, a plant based policy. For example, um, there's a few councils that are doing um, plant based at the minute. They're, they're signing the plant based treaty. Uh, Glastonbury Council, uh, Oxford Plant Council have signed a plant based treaty. They're, they're getting uh, Bristol City Council to sign it as well. So that's in the pipeworks. Um, and I'm hoping that once those councils do sign those treaties, things will improve. But there's a lot that businesses can do as well. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and yeah, do, is there anything else that you would like to add? Maybe? Yeah, actually, um, that was incredible. And I think everything there is everything that we need to hear. And I think going back to one of your points about the link into activism and Part of that can be to open up space, as you said, for your employees to be able to go and take action and to be able to have challenge go and do that. So, for example, for me, I'm going to drop down to a four-day working week, which I'm very privileged to be able to do. I'm very privileged that my company will let me do that. And that's that I can dedicate my other day to an organisation that will very, very gratefully let me bring my climate activism together. And that means that I'm making a difference. That means I'm going to have way more energy when I'm at work to be able to make a difference in that role then also um, cross-pollinate the learning system both. So there are so many different ways that you can um, take action as a business. So just off we've got two minutes left. Um, another thing that we would love for you to do on a post-it note, if you've got space, is just to write one thing that you can lobby for or against as a business or as an individual. And we'll just wait for the to take one minute and really quickly start. It could be global, it could be local, it could be anything you'd like it to be. Anything that you believe that you have the power to do, anything that you think would make the most amount of difference for your country. Or if you're an individual as well, maybe there's something local, maybe there's something global, maybe there's an activist group that lobbies against something that you could do. Thank you. 